This workshop is maximizing board effectiveness. It's in room uh, 118. And uh, my name is Jim Galvin. I'm a consultant to nonprofits and churches and universities. And uh, my specialties are in governance and strategy. So we'll begin this workshop about maximizing board effectiveness. And there's three kinds of boards, managing boards, governing boards, navigating boards. We're going to talk about what they are, and you have to decide what kind of board you want to be. So that's your role today, to know what kind of board are you now, what kind of board you want to be in the future, and what do you need to do to be effective at that. And your board might not be living up to its potential, what you know it's capable of, and especially if... Uh, you are in an organization where you don't select your own board members, it's ten times as bad. Because they, they, you need the ability to screen and select. Maybe some group approves them, but uh, if, if you don't control who you bring in, like in a school association, here's how the meeting goes. We need someone to uh, serve on the, the school association board. And in the voters meeting, everyone goes like this. And then finally someone says, Mary Ann, you think you, you recently retired, you think you'd want to do this? Oh, I suppose. And then she's a candidate and gets on the board with no training, no understanding. And how are you supposed to have an effective board like that? It's a dysfunctional system uh, when you have that. With school associations, I always say to get away from the representative model because it's dumb. It doesn't work. So you want your organization to function effectively, you want the board to function effectively. Uh, the board needs to add value to the organization. Board members in ministry settings don't know what add value means, so I had to change that to make a net contribution. Like you're using up time, it costs money for the pastor and the staff to get all the reports together, and if you come together and you have nothing to add to it, what are you doing? It'd be cheaper if you didn't have the board meeting but you're required by your bylaws to have it, and you're not sure what to do, so how do we fix that? This presentation is divided into five parts. We're gonna go really quickly through some of these and more slowly on others, and you can ask a question at any point. And I'm gonna to stop to have short discussions as we go. So first we'll start with board types. There's three types of boards, and how did I come to that conclusion? I started with basic systems, but because when you look out in the literature, uh, Christian and secular about governance, it's contradictory. Like one book will say, you need some professional expertise like an accountant, a lawyer, uh, a banker, that kind of thing. And other books will say, definitely do not ever do that. Right? And so how can we reconcile all that? Well, this is, this is how we can. So basic systems theory invented in the late 1950s, early 1960s. It postulated that every organization, every thing in the world has inputs, processes, and outputs. And it has a feedback system to make sure it's on course so it can self-correct and it's functioning in some kind of environment. And so for a computer, you have an input device, you have a microprocessor, and you output a file or a printed page, right? The computer is doing self-checks to make sure uh, everything is working fine and uh, you're in some kind of environment. Where do basic systems come from? What academic field of study? Statistics. Statistics? Bzz, no. What's that? Sociology? Bzz, no. Manufacturing? Manufacturing? Bzz, no. Anthropology. Anthropology. Close biology because you have a plant that has input of carbon dioxide water and sunshine you have a process called photosynthesis and the output is a, a, a chloro chlorophyll I was gonna say chloroform <laughs> chlorophyll and oxygen right and that's a system that's where systems theory came from and that highly influ influenced computer sciences so that we have uh, something similar. Uh, this is what I base my consulting in. I come in looking at the system, looking at the environment it's operating in, looking at the inputs and outputs 
to see if it's a healthy organization or not. So when you combine that with in the board setting, it's like everything that happens in the church or in our organization is inside the black box. And as a board, we sit on top of that and monitor what's going on. And we're operating in some kind of ministry context here in a community, uh, in a society, uh, a smaller part of a bigger organization. And we got resources coming in, which is financial, people, and information. We have everything that happens day to day inside of the organization and results coming out, which for any ministry needs to be life change or community change. There are no other outputs for a social agency, for a ministry, for a nonprofit that's trying to make the world better. And then we, we have quarterly reviews or annual reviews to check our progress so we got feedback happening. There's only three things you can do with the black box. You can open the black box up and take a look at everything that's happening inside. Worse, you can put your hand in it and try to move things around. That's called micromanaging. Right? The second option is you can oversee what's happening in the box and set some limits to it, like some laws that they can't uh, avoid. Look at the resources coming in and the results coming out. That's, that's called overseeing or governing. And when you do that with an organization you know or one you don't know, you just look at the resources going in and the results coming out, it can be staggering, right? Because you have a very inefficient system. Uh, as a governing board, you want to make sure there's adequate resources and make sure it's achieving results. And you keep the lid on the box shut. Just like the Mini Mart, you want this to throw off cash and you don't care what it looks like on the inside that much as long as it's not too bad. So I'm gonna, so that gives us the three types of boards, managing, governing, and navigating. I forgot to tell you the third thing. So you can open the box and look in it, leave the box closed, look at results and resources, or you can pick up the box and move it somewhere else. That's called a navigating board. For example, I'm in conversation with a foster care agency in one state in the Midwest, and the state has recently changed its laws in a way that makes it difficult for the foster care agency to operate within their Christian principles. So they've decided they're going to get out of foster care and they have to do something else and they don't know what it is. Right? A policy manual isn't going to help them. Right? So that board has to become a navigating board and say we got all these church relationships, we have all these donors, we know a lot about children and family. What else could we do? Navigating boards change the mission of the organization and change location, change the name, so that it's a better fit for the environment that they're in. Any questions on these three types? Is it, is it clear or is there something else you'd like to know? So each of these three, all three of these are fine. They're all legitimate. And you can do them very well or you can do them poorly. So for a managing board, you want to function like an executive management team. Like, you know, the, the, the suits in a Fortune 500 company. You want to talk on that level, not about everything that's happening inside the organization. That's micromanaging you're talking about all the activities that are happening or making decisions about all the activities, we're only making the big decisions about the activities, but you're still in there trying to make it happen. Instead of being results oriented, uh, a couple other things that you brought up of using an inquiring approach, asking how we can help, those are good healthy managing board type, type of behaviors. Governing board, if you're doing it right, you're policy based, you have a policy manual written and you use it. I worked with one RSO, the children named Nameless, and the board chair is about, I don't know, 85. And I talked to the director, very big operation, huge endowment, huge endowment for 
uh, the kind of ministry that they were. And I said, uh, are you guys policy based? Yep. Can I see your manual? Yep. I'll email it to you. I got it. It was nice. Obviously, they hired a consultant to come in and help them write it. It was in good shape. I wouldn't recommend editing it even. So I called the board chair and asked him a couple questions. He's been chair for a long time. And I said, um, by the way, I'm looking at his manual. Are you guys a uh, policy based? He goes, oh yeah, yeah. I go, how's that work? Oh, it really works good. Tell me, do you actually have your policies in writing? He goes, no, I don't think so. So what's going on there? They went from policy based to micro, micro governing. So if there's micromanaging, there must also be micro governing. And two types are just becoming very laissez faire down here and not, you know, just putting your manual on the shelf. And the other is becoming obsessed with wordsmithing all your policies, like it's the most important thing in the world, like it's it's an indoor sport or something. And so, so we don't want to be here. We want to be up here, following. The principles of policy-based governance as best we can. There's always exceptions that come up or decisions that have to go to the board meeting. Navigating boards is a transformative governance where you're changing the organization in big ways because you have to to survive. The opposite of that is trying to keep everything the same. Think about a museum for, I mean a board for a museum. The world's changing around them. Next generation is coming up. People don't care about history uh, or anthropology. And so they're, they're trying to keep everything the same, keep the museum afloat, keep it alive, keep people interested in it. And uh, they're not policy-based, and they're just trying to raise money, right, to keep it going. So for a church, you, uh, navigating board is almost not an option because you're not going to change your mission. Your mission is in Matthew 28. If you're not sure what your mission is, read it and then get back to me. But the mission comes from Jesus. So that's our mission. When do you enter navigating mode? When the church has to close and somebody has to decide who to sell the assets to or who to give them to or look up if it goes to the district or not. Right. Um, and, and or making decisions to close a school. That's not a policy, right? That's a navigating type of decision. And what do we do with the building? And do we sell it to the charter school down the street? Or what do we do? So that's, that's the only times you get into navigating mode. Otherwise, you're either managing or governing or doing something else really dysfunctional. Any questions on these three? Yes. So positive change is always You bring up a hard question. Uh, it's more uh, how do you handle good situations or bad situations based on what kind of board that you are, what kind of mode that you're functioning in at the moment. I know it's a little bit confusing. But if you're a managing board, you'll make the decision. Well, you probably always make decisions to start the school together. You might need a voters meeting approval to do something that major. So there it just goes right up the system. Um, but uh, it's not so much a good situation or bad situation. It's when do you make decision? Who makes what decision? Does the board make decision, or does the board set policy and staff makes a decision, or do the voters make the decision? So policy governance just helps you know who makes what decision. So we've already talked through this a little bit, and why I say. A lot of congregations should not use policy-based governance because they have, they're really small and they have a pastor who doesn't have leadership or administrative gifts. He's got the heart of a shepherd. He's uh, excellent at chaplain type of activities, pastoral care, but he can't balance his own checkbook. So you can't do policy-based governance when you have a leader like that in place. You're forced. You have to become a managing board uh, with one medium-sized church I worked with, I said, with your pastor, you as a board, 
You have to set annual ministry goals together with them because if you don't, nobody will. So you're, they're forced into that level of detail. Let's say you're on the board of an animal shelter. You have only dogs, and your director is phenomenal. She's wonderful. Everybody loves her, but she can't make a decision. She comes to the board meetings and going, you know, we're talking about whether or not to add wet dog food for the first two weeks that we're here. We don't want to give them wet dog food all the time because it'll spoil them. They won't eat the dry stuff, but it's really expensive. What do you think we should do? Okay. As a board, you're drug right into that, right? And you either have to get another director or you have to help her make those decisions. Policy-based boards, you need disciplined board members. They'll stay out of the weeds. You need to be proactive instead of reactive. You want results-oriented ends policies, which most congregations don't have. You want clear limitations policies, which some congregations do have. And you always want to strive for consensus. So if you have nine people on the board, you want every vote to be nine to zero as much as possible. You never, ever want a five to four vote. That means you haven't talked through it enough. You haven't found the best solution. So let's say you have a hospital. They need a board because of law. So they get leading members in the community, and they're in there, and they're overseeing the budget of this huge hospital. Most people never seen that many zeros behind a number, right? And every department in a hospital loses money except one. Do you know which department that is? No, surgery. Surgery is the only profitable department. How are you, as a leading community member, going to help the hospital manage better? How are you going to make decisions about what they should do when you're dealing with unions, uh, uh, Medicare, <coughs> federal guidelines for health, and doctors? Right? How you have the only qualification those board members have is they've been to the doctor. And so they have to be policy-based. Virtually all hospitals are policy-based. Lots and lots of universities are policy-based because they're so big and complex and the people you bring on the board don't have any expertise in higher education or healthcare or whatever it is. Yes? Yeah. This one? If you send me an email, I'll send you a handout with all this in it uh, for anybody that wants to. And navigating boards, which is less common, when, when you have a startup organization, they're in navigating mode because <coughs> they're making decisions about mission, what to do, who to hire. They're making it all happen. They're involved in the startup. They want to be looking for breakthroughs. They focus on the future and they use generative thinking and they're not trying to manage this, they're trying to get the organization out of its hole and get it uh, headed in a new direction. So let's say you had an orphanage in the 1940s or 1950s and the state where you live decided to switch to a foster care system. Now, you don't run on state money, it's 100% uh, uh, from donors and churches in your area You've been very successful. You got this big old building, but now you cannot get any kids because the state has switched to a foster care system. Your ministry is gone. So what do you do? What assets do you have? We got a building, we got donors, we got churches. What should we do with this? There was a tuberculosis sanatorium owned by Lutherans <coughs> in Wheat Ridge, Colorado, and that happened to them. Tuberculosis was cured. What do you need a sanatorium for? They had a beautiful campus with nobody on it. So that board had to go into navigating mode. You can't manage your way out of that. Okay? They went to navigating mode and said, what should we do with all these assets? Uh, set up a different treatment plan for a different disease. Right? Uh, start a school. So they sold the campus, took all the money, put it into, made a creative foundation called Wheat Ridge which is now, I think, called We, we Race? We Race. We Race, yeah. Uh, so they were in navigating mode. 
amongst yourself for two minutes. What kind of board do you have right now? What kind do you need going forward? Self-organize. Decisive, you know, what kind of dog yeah, so yeah. I was thinking about that and vacillating over that for a few minutes and thinking, well, what if the director, you know, they they came to the board and asked those questions to try to get a consensus from the different board members as to what do you think is best, rather than her just making that decision. I mean, what, I mean, would that be wrong, or too much vacillation? Or? Well, you have the owners and you got the manager, so if you say, we want these three things changed, she goes, okay. If you say, we'll help you make these changes, you're just getting deeper into the weeds. Okay. And then if you start managing it together with her, you can't hold her accountable for results. Okay. All right. Yeah. I see where you're coming from. Yeah. 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 All right. Coming back together as a group. Quick show of hands so we can see where we're at, how many say right now you have a managing board? How many would say right now you have a managing board? How many say right now you have a governing board? How many right now would say you have a navigating board? Nobody, see, it's rare uh, in church situations. Now you go to technology companies and those are all navigating boards, right? They don't care about policy, they care about what's happening with semiconductors. They bring on people who know the industry better than the CEO, right? They have that, not, they're, they're the think tank, they're the brain trust that the CEO draws on. So they're naturally, and they're in a very turbulent environment. And that's, what, that's why they have to be navigating boards. And sometimes those boards really mess up those companies. Yes? Yeah, so a thought partnership with the board. Um, we, if you're a policy base, you want to have a single point of accountability with just one staff person. And uh, we want to be helpful to the staff person. But generally, in a church or a nonprofit, uh, church has members on the board, nonprofit has donors, others from the community on the board. And the CEO or pastor is a trained professional and the rest of the board members are a bunch of volunteers, essentially. The church members don't know how to run the church better than the pastor. They don't understand ministry better than the pastor. They can set some boundaries. If the pastor or director wants to bring up 
hey guys help me think this through okay that's his or her call but I've, I always talk to board members that say, you know, when doing training, you know, well, we, want, we like the church, we want to help. We think we got some good ideas to help the pastor, okay? They want to give him advice. And what's the last, if you give him advice, is he supposed to take it? <laughs> yeah. That's why I tell, that's why I tell pastors, never, never ask for advice on what to do because it draws the board into management. You want that? Might they have some expertise that you can draw on? Yes. Maybe you can get it outside of the boardroom, right? Um, maybe you can just get the three or four sharpest people and say, help me think this through because I've not faced this situation before. You can do it in the board meeting too, but the board has to be very disciplined in saying, we're just helping you think about this. We're not telling you how to solve the problem. We're not giving you advice. But if you don't do what we say, no. <laughs> so, uh, these are the three types. Again, I'll email the handout if, if you would like. So when you're going from a managing board to a governing board, especially in churches where you have parish planning council model or admin model, and you have 14 or 15 ministry boards, uh, a third of them don't even, aren't even functioning, and you have to wipe out all that, get a single board of directors, um, and decide whether you'll be managing or governing. For a nonprofit or it has a single board of directors, it's managing. How do you shift from managing to governing? You have to write your policies in a manual. That's the main shift. So if you don't have a single board, get it. That's the first step. Once you have a single board, write your policy manual. Generally for congregation, it's about 17, 20 pages long and you want it to be easy to read, easy to use, uh, clearly written, and not detailed to the nth degree, like policy 2.5.7.8.12. Mm -hmm. If you're going from governing to navigating, there has to be a crisis, and you're dealing with a shift in the environment that was unforeseen. And so if you don't have those things, don't become a navigating board. Because, uh, and make sure you have the expertise you need people who understand the situation or understand organizational change. Once the crisis is over, so for navigating the board, you set the policy manual aside and you make all these changes. Then after a year or two, you got everything in place running smoothly again. You got a director in place. Now you have to go back to the discipline of policy-based governance. And then this happens a lot during COVID is you have a board that was policy based, but because you've gone from 450 in worship to 120 and your pastor took another call and the SMP guy is the only pastor on staff. You have to set the policies aside and move into managing mode because you're forced into it because there's nobody willing to make the hard decisions. So it depends on your context. So the managing board stuff, it comes from best practices and management principles and traditional approaches to boards minus micromanaging. The governing approach comes from John Carver in his book, Boards That Make a Difference, and some other people have written on policy development. Navigating board, even though they don't use this word, comes from the guys from Harvard that say, you know what, there's a lot more to governing than writing policies. And there's a lot more the board can contribute. And they're, again, thinking the Fortune 500 high-tech kind of companies where they, you bring in people who know the industry better than you do. So those are three types of boards. Which one are you? Where do you want to be? You cannot be a governing board without a written policy manual. And we have tons of them in the Missouri Senate. They say they're governing, but they're not. So we'll find out why. Uh, we got time, so I'm going to show you uh, the newest document from the International Standards Organization. Anyone know what ISO 9001 means? Raise your hand. What is it? It's an international standard of quality. Quality management. 
ISO 9001. Ice, ice, if back on a truck, you're driving the highway, and it says ISO 27001, what does that mean? Environmental. It means uh, transportation of refrigerated goods. Okay, there's international standards for that. Um, and I forgot to move the board forward. So these containers are made all over the world, and they all fit together perfectly, and they all work the same. How come? Because they're all following the international standards for containers. That's why it fits. That, that's why it works. And now we have ISO 37000, brand new. Most people have never heard of it. And it's the international standards for governance of any of those three types of boards, for-profit, not-for-profit, non-governmental organizations, every kind of board around the world, approved 100% by all the member nations. It's cross-cultural, and it works for small organizations, works for big organizations. So this is the bigger framework. You can Google this and find it online just by ISO 37000. Point one is the board, this is, here's what happens. Some board members are reluctant to shift to policy-based governance because if you do and you write your policy manual, they say, what are we going to talk about as a board? So this answers that question. Here's 11 things that boards uh, can do. So one, keep the organization focused on its purpose. What's the main thing? Make sure you don't have stuff that's squirting out that doesn't get you to where you're trying to go, doesn't produce the kind of results that you're going to have. Like a Chamber of Commerce um, organization I worked with, uh, they were tired of running the beer tent for the summer festival, right? But they couldn't because it was built into their budget. So they got this thing that's over here that's not taking where they want to go, but they can't, couldn't get out of it. So the board can say, why are we doing that? And that's board work, because you're keeping the board on mission, on purpose. Point two, value generation. Nobody even knows what this means. A lot of, uh, a lot of consultants don't even know what it means yet. It means, it means your business model in a nonprofit context. So let's say your mission, your purpose is to see children come to faith in Jesus Christ. Is that a result? Yeah, 100%. Where are the resources going in? But what's our value generation model? So you can start backyard Bible clubs. You can start a branch of child evangelism society. You can start a preschool. You can plant a church. Those are all value generation models. So the board can make sure we have the right value generation model to accomplish the results that we're trying to achieve. And you can ask questions about the value generation model. Then you need strategy. And I say boards need to be involved in strategy formation. Some boards that are really policy-based or are in really large organizations say, you as a staff come up with strategy. We're, we're not as smart as you to be able to do that. We want you to show it to us, explain it to us, and we'll approve it or not approve it. But they're involved in the strategy level. And um, Carver generally doesn't like that. And the International Standards Organization does take your pick. Who you want to uh, uh, stick with? Oversight is monitoring what's going on. It's one of the biggest failures of boards is they don't read the materials, they don't prepare, they don't look at the budget very hard, and they get in the board meeting, and they just, or they shift to policy-based governance, write their manual, and then don't monitor everything. The principle is you want to keep your nose in and your fingers out. So you can go, you can, at church it's easy, you're in church, you're in worship, maybe you've got children involved in some of the ministries, you know teachers, uh, you have a natural way of monitoring that way, but what else does the board need to do to oversee, oversee it without micromanaging? Point five is holding the leader, organizational leader and staff <laughs> accountable for the results you're trying to achieve and also for remaining ethical and um, of high character. 
a lot of boards don't have the guts to hold the leader accountable. And that's their job. You need people who aren't afraid to hold others accountable. You don't have to do it in a mean way, right? That's one thing the board should do. Stakeholder engagement, uh, keeping members of the congregation informed. If you're a community agency, you got stakeholders, you got partners, keeping them engaged and informed because your ministry is not going to work if you don't have all these other stakeholders doing their part. So the board can be involved in that. It's not messing with the ministry. Uh, the board can provide leadership where it's needed. You might have insights about how society is changing. You might have opinions on what to do with wokeness. And you can uh, provide leadership through some difficult times or difficult situation or your pastor gets hit by bus number 37 and you don't have a pastor, then the board needs to step in and provide that leadership. Uh, data and decisions, I like to say data informed, not data driven for nonprofits. So what's the organization measuring? Well, budget, number of people involved, that's fine. None of those are measures of results. What are the results we're going to try to achieve? How do we measure that? What are we trying to do here? Well, we're trying to help people grow spiritually, okay? What indicator do you have that people are growing spiritually? I don't know. If the Holy Spirit's working in a person's heart and he's growing spiritually, he's being reformed in Jesus, become more like Jesus, might that change some of his or her behaviors? Well, yeah, of course. Okay, so which behaviors? Now you can start to measure it in a rough way when we're in ministry or social service rather than in an exact way, but you can certainly, you can exactly count adult baptisms, right? And it's obviously a result kind of measure. So what other data do we need? Do you need some community data? Do you need longer range financial data? You can ask for this stuff. Uh, it's just helping you understand so you can oversee it better. Risk governance. We should call it risk management because the staff make sure you have adequate insurance and uh, the playground is safe and all those kind of things. At the board level, we're just going to ensure that the risk management is happening. So internationally, they've coined the term risk governance. And you want to think about what might go wrong. Think about where you have uh, an unnecessary opening to attract a lawsuit like one congregation doing summer cookout for homeless people who live on the streets near their church. What if some of the food is tainted and some of the homeless people die? You think you're not gonna get sued? And you have volunteers cook hot dogs? Where were those hot dogs before? Right, this is the kind of questions boards can ask to protect the organization. Social responsibility is just more like in manufacturing or if you're an airline and you're on the board, you want to make sure that uh, we're doing the least we can to uh, pollute the atmosphere. If you're a, a strip mine in Wyoming, you know, how do we mitigate against uh, environmental damage? Or social responsibility, we're in this community, what should we do, be doing to make the community better? And viability and performance over time. So for ministries, I call this sustainable mission fulfillment. That's the job of the board, is to make sure we're going to survive and we're going to be effective over the long haul. One problem with putting parents on school boards, Christian school boards, is their time span is only until their kid graduates from eighth grade, right? And you need people who can look farther from than that. So also having a parent on a school board is a conflict of interest. It's not a potential conflict. It's a real conflict of interest, especially if they're setting tuition. The best kind of board members there are alumni or parents of alumni who have that, parents of alumni who have that longer time span. I'll try to project. Any questions on this? It's sort of academic. You've never heard it anywhere before. You can buy a set of the standards from Geneva, Switzerland for 
or you can just look on the internet and see, get a rough overview of what's happening. So that's international principles. Next we'll move to board posture. So that means leaning in, being involved in the conversations, being proactive, preparing ahead of time like board, good board, board members should do. Now, most board members have not re received any training in governance. By the time we hit uh, 4.30, you will have had formal training in board governance. Most board members don't. Uh, and they've never read a book on governance before letting their name stand for the position. So they got no experience or no uh, knowledge. And especially if you have a policy-based board, they've never served on a policy-based board, they've never reported to a policy-based board, they've never observed a policy-based board in action. By the way, observing a policy-based board in action is quite boring. Something comes up, there's a question, you dialogue on it a little bit, someone says, do we have policy on that? Yes. Does it cover the situation? Yes. So after 25 minutes, okay, move on. Sound like fun? They never observed it, they never read a book, they never had any training, but everyone has a mental model of how a board is supposed to function. <laughs> so if they never read a book, they never seen it, where does the mental model come from? <laughs> Television and movies. They re meet, they rent, meet Joe Black, they see Brad Pitt come into the boardroom, it's a long table, everyone's sitting down in suits and ties, two guys at each end having an argument, they have a vote to fire the chairman, the CEO, everyone goes yes, 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 no, yes, yes, no, yes, yes, yes. No conversation. Makes for a bad movie. Or they go to their local school board, which in Wheaton where we used to live, everything was about the north side versus the south side. And the two high schools had to have equivalent uh, uh, offerings, right? And it was always had that political co uh, component. So I got asked to serve on the school board or to let my name stand. I got begged to have my name stand because the school had just um, uh, put in a new sex ed curriculum, okay? that the parents went berserk about and all the churches went berserk about. And so I said, I, I won't let my name stand, but I'll observe the 10 meetings over the next course of the year and just see if I think I can make any contribution to this in terms of helping the educational system. It is 98% politics and 2% education. And I just had, didn't have any stomach for that, so that was that. So. Boards can be over controlling or out of control. And so when you're over controlling, sometimes it's called a working board. As you hire staff and just make the big decisions, you become an intervening board, sometimes managing board. And when you are you've got staff that know more than you do, then you have to move to becoming an overseeing board that's watching what's happening, not making decisions, not uh, providing the the uh, strategic direction for the organization, but participating in that process. But if you don't have a board policy manual, you become a ratifying board. So if you say you're a governing board, you don't have any policies, you're actually a ratifying board. You're bringing no value. You sit there, the organizational leader has to come in with all the proposals, and you talk about them and say yes or no, usually yes, and then you leave and have a cup of coffee at the end. And then if people stop showing up or they don't prepare, then you have a disengaged board uh, where, you know, might be a board that's pretty, pretty large in size, but 40% of the people never say a word in the whole board meeting. How did they get on the board? What do they, what do they think they're supposed to do? They're just there to listen and vote yes. So, if you have a, every time, I'm gonna skip that part, every time I've done this, it's like, yeah, sometimes we're an intervening board, sometimes we're a ratifying board, but we just sort of flip back and forth in between board meetings. And I call this the $100,000 oops. It's like, oops, $100,000, where did that go? Show us, give me more detail, financials. 
how, how do we where do how do we fill in this gap? How, you know, where's the rest of this? Well, they weren't paying attention over here to the finances or another organization. I'm starting with they had a, a CFO who said all the finances were there, and he said, no, no, that's that's not a problem. That's going to be in next year, not this year. Don't even worry about it. It was a ninety thousand dollar problem. Um, so how do you keep from flipping back and forth? And this is universal, right? Is you write a policy manual, and that helps stabilize you in the overseeing role, and helps you stay out of the weeds, and helps keep the organization under control. And policy based is different from politically based. And this is where in church a lot of new board members come in, and they've seen the city council, or they've seen a community board, and it's it's about voting, whereas policy base is about consensus. Politically based is about arguments. Policy base is about working together as a team. Politically based is people representing different factions. Right? Policy based is everybody represents the entire congregation and the school. Everybody represents every aspect of our nonprofit. So this is a difficult distinction uh, to get out of the brains of new board members. And uh, the Harvard guys have shown us there's three, three ways of thinking when you're functioning as a board. The first is your fiduciary oversight. Uh, how, what's our financial condition? What's our fundraising department looking like? Uh, are we going to be sustainable over the long term? Uh, anything bad happening that we need to deal with. But if everything's going smooth in the local congregation, you can do this in 10 minutes. Then what do you do with the rest of your time? Aha, you can move to the strategic level and talk about what are our longer range goals? What's our direction here? What's our simple church model? How are we accomplishing that? What has to happen next? We're here now. How do we get to there, Pastor? And you can join in and a strategic level, and that's a lot more fun than going over the budget in detail. <laughs> and then the Harvard guys introduced uh, generative thinking, where it's not just how do we get from here to there, but where is there, and what else might, for a church, what else might God have for us to do? What's changing in our community? Are, are there any new needs where we can be a part of the solution? So managing boards are the... Uh, Managing boards and fiduciary activity is like this, right? You're looking at the operations and what's happening. When you move to the strategic level, you're looking outside of the organization. That's the key word. What's changing in the community? How are we functioning? Do we need to do anything different as a congregation? And generative thinking is going, what else, God, might you have in mind for us to do? Any questions on board posture? posture? We want board members engaged, prepared, having deep conversations, but staying out of the weeds and staying out of day-to-day -day operations unless you have to. We're not going to write board policies today, so we're going to skip this part. We're going to move to best practices. So these are ways of functioning that I have learned from my clients. Like everything, every time I see something really good or read about something really good or the 20 of us who do governance consulting in the wider evangelical space that we decide is the best practice, I've included here. So these are you know, things you can borrow from other congregations and use them in your own board meeting. And this works for churches, RSOs, nonprofits, social service agencies. First is to eliminate postage. Like if you can send everything by email or electronically or have a website resource where people can tap into it, it saves paper. And what you absolutely do not want to do is have board members come, especially true for national organization, and give them a binder with 100 pages in it, right? So 
because what are they going to do? They're going to be looking at their binder and trying to see what, what's all is in here instead of engaging in conversation. You want to send it out five days, seven days ahead of time. Everyone comes to the board meeting. Everyone's prepared. And now you deliberate together. Um, I had one high-level Missouri Synod layperson who was on the board of a large organization. I was doing some board training with him when I showed this slide. He goes, I disagree. He says, I was on the CTCU or what's it called? TCR. TCR, yeah. They sent me 300 pages. I had to bring it to the printer and it cost me $100 to photocopy it. <laughs> and I said, everything got quiet, right? I said, Joe, can you tell us how you really feel about this? <laughs> Consent agenda, how many people use it? And Denny, can you explain how it works? Yes. And discuss it if they like. Yeah. But otherwise, you just call for a motion and adopt it on the agenda. Yes. So you only talk about what needs to be talked about. So in a church setting, you got the youth report, you got the evangelism report, which has nothing on it. You have discipleship report. You got the school report. You got the pastor's report. You got the budget report. And the chair brings it all there and says, Anyone, before we move to receive the reports, anyone have a question? You have a question about youth ministry report. Okay, he pulls that out. I have a question about pastor's report. He pulls that out. And it's like, what's your question on youth ministry? Is there going to be a retreat this summer? Yes, in June. What's your question about the pastor's report? Pastor answers it. Okay, let's all vote to receive this. All in favor, say aye. I, I, by the way, I was leading an international board meeting in Israel representatives from four continents and I became the chair and the very first meeting I said all in favor said aye and they said what? <laughs> so all in favor say yes. Oh yes. <laughs> so what do small churches do especially if parish planting council model? Give a staff person or the ministry board person give a verbal report of everything they did last month. And that takes, and with the budget, takes a whole hour, right, to do. And it's much better to have them uh, in writing ahead of time because if you bring in staff people and they give you the report, they're telling you how hard they work. Yeah. And that's good, but you can't govern with that information. And it's all about activities, and we want to stay out of the activities. We want to see results coming out of it. So this is a number one tip that you can take home if you don't currently do it. It takes some discipline to get all the reports and writing ahead of time. Yes? So you're asking each committee to send a written synopsis of the last quarter on what they've done. Yeah. If if, it's, uh, if you're in a small church, you'll have ministry boards or committees doing that. If you're in a university, you'll have committees. If you're in a larger church, you'll have staff reports okay, coming so to you. smaller church, then, you get half a dozen reports set. And then at the meeting itself... Everyone gets all the reports. Everyone reads them ahead of time. You come together. If there's no questions, you move on. Beautiful. Yeah, you just said, wow. <laughs> uh, how many have a dashboard at work? This is a, on one side of one sheet of paper, key measurements of where you're at. And they're nice little Excel charts. They're in color, you know, and it's fun to look at. It's a lot better than looking at a spreadsheet, right? So why don't you have a dashboard like that that maybe shows the monthly giving for the trailing 12 months. So you can see the pattern. 
December giving for the previous five Decembers. So you can see if things are going up and down. Uh, attendance, uh, average ten, attendance over the last five years on a diagram. Like th things start, might start feeling a little more um, less crowded in the sanctuary. But when you see that diagram, it sort of raises its, its early indicator of what's happening. So we get them at work. Let's have one for ministry too. Just the hard part is just figuring out what do you want to measure. Standing committees, Carver generally doesn't uh, recommend. He recommends ad hoc committees instead. And I do that for congregations as well, for uh, universities, large national non nonprofits. They need certain standing committees because of how they're functioning. For a local congregation, you don't need any, especially if you have nine people on your board. If you've got 48 people on your board, it's different. But if you've got nine people on your board, all of you can talk about all the issues and make any key decisions that have to be made. If you have to set a revenue target for 2024, you just have three guys go together and get coffee and look at what's been happening in giving, look at the economy, and then come up with their projected revenue. You don't want the staff to come up with that revenue projection because they'll add up all the costs and make that their revenue projection. You need the board needs to determine that. Uh, executive session is where you ask the pastor, organizational leader, to leave the room so the board by itself um, can have time to talk about what they're going to talk about. So the best practice is to do it at the beginning of the meeting and at the end of the meeting. And um, me individually, I say, I don't care if it's at the beginning or at the end, but you have to have it every time. And why do you want executive session where you put the pastor out of the room every time? Anyone know? If you get in the habit of not doing it, all of a sudden you do it, it's a big deal. If you do it every time, if it's routine, he's not worried. If you do it once, what the heck? <laughs> right? How does this differ from asking the board for advice, though? Yeah, well, <laughs> this is, uh, what this does is uh, executive session before eliminates the meeting before the meeting at the coffee shop, and then it eliminates the parking lot meeting <laughs> after the meeting, right? Which I'm working at congregations, I always see the parking lot meeting because I'm one of the last people to leave. Right? Yeah, no, I don't. The pastor does participate in executive meeting or not? Executive session is where pastor and any other staff are out. It's only board members. Okay. I was working with Judson University, met with their board, they opened in prayer, and then the president and I had to go out into the lobby. And I'm sitting there chatting them up, so tell me about your kids and where'd you go to college, what'd you major in, you know. Uh, and pretty soon, it's been 30 minutes. And I started getting nervous, <laughs> right? And then I asked him, does this happen often? He goes, oh, yeah, every time. Okay, he wasn't nervous at all. So the board's just trying to get its act together, right? Because they haven't met in between the quarterly meetings. They're trying to get all their information right and trying to decide what order to talk about things or whether to take something off the agenda. So that's executive session. Uh, auxiliary group, uh, if you are not a church, uh, you need some other type of way to find future board members. Often it comes from volunteers or donors. For one homeless agency I worked with, they have their board, and they have an uh, auxiliary board. And I'm going, why do you have an auxiliary board? What, it, what is that for? And he said, they're mostly dealing with programming issues. They don't really have the authority, they're like an advisory board, but you don't have to be a Christian to be on the auxiliary board. You have to be a believer to be on a regular board. So it's, it's a way to involve people who are heavily invested in the organization. And when you have, this is for younger people too. So when you have younger people performing well on that board, you can go, we want you to come on to the main board. So you need some kind of pipeline. In a church, it's natural because you look at all the people involved in ministry, and they're all right there. And if someone's not doing anything at church, and you invite that person on the board, hmm, sounds funny to me. Hand signals are just, uh, especially if you're just moving to policy-based governance, 
and you want to stay out of the weeds, you need some kind of indicator that we're off track. Like you can throw a T, or some of my colleagues give their boards a stop sign on a popsicle stick. And then as the board's working, anyone can hold up a stop sign and people go, okay, are we doing board work now or are we doing staff work? Yeah, we're, we're over the line here. Let's let this one go. The organizational leader will take care of it. Uh, so a T, just raise your hand. Uh, with one congregation, my home congregation before, when we switched, all I had to do was clear my throat and people go, what? Uh, process check is two or three questions you ask at the end of every board meeting. So did we stay out of the weeds and stick to board work? Did we treat each other like Christian brothers and sisters? Is there anything anyone needs to apologize about? Whatever your three questions are. And that raises the board discipline. And also, if you have any problematic members, they're going to get an earful at the end of the meeting. So if everyone knows those questions are going to be asked, you get better behavior. Uh, private board website or churches tell me they don't want the board members on the website. They want their bios on a wall that's heavily tra a heavily trafficked hallway so everyone can see who they are. And you want this to talk about how did you get connected to the congregation in the first place? What do you do for work? Tell us about your family. And as people walk by and they go, oh, I know most of the board members, it raises the level of trust in a congregation. For a national ministry, you don't have a hallway, so putting your board members, not just their name, but something like this on your website, again, can raise trust of donors. You're learning a little bit about who's overseeing the organization. How'd you get connected with the church? What do you do for money? Okay. Tell us a little bit about your family. Um, and one church told, told me, uh, well, we were talking with this other consultant. He said, never let anyone find out who's on your board. Um, and there are national ministries that are involved in a type of work where it's dangerous for the board members to be no notified. So you got to figure out what's, what's best for your organization. You can do a web survey if you're in a congregation. You can survey parents of youth. You can survey preschool parents. You can survey people over 65. You're gathering information. You're monitoring. You're not violating policy-based governance. If you start opening the lid and making changes because of that information, then you stepped over the line. But just gather information is okay. Yeah. Can you speak about term limits in board? Yeah, for Missouri Senate, they either have this is typical two year term and three term limit. Or they have three year term and two term limit with the seventh year off. I prefer no term limits, right? Because you lose good people. But what that requires is discipline on the board. So if I do a two-year term, it's easier to recruit for a two-year term than a three-year term. So if I let my name stand for a two-year term, and you say, Jim, can you do this again? If I say, sure, it's not automatic. It has to be put into the interview system. You've got to have other new people. All of them are interviewed together, and the person who is currently on the board doesn't have an edge. You just want the ping pong ball that bounces highest to become the new board member. So that's how you weed out uh, the, the weaker board members. But boards are chicken to do that. And so they need term limits. Uh, refreshments, even if it's only coffee and water bottles. But if you do better than that, it's nice. You want to pay attention to the seating. Uh, so you want to set up the meeting uh, either in a circle, a square, a horseshoe, or something where everybody can see everybody. Situation like this, you can't see everybody, but that's what they have in Meet Joe Black, so that must be what a good boardroom is. Hang time is once or twice a year. I go out to eat together with spouses or have a steak fry at someone's house. You're not conducting business. You're just building relationships. 
because the board has to function like a team and boards are usually horrible at having relationship building time and it makes everything go so much smoother. Board retreat once a year is a best practice, doesn't have to be off-site, doesn't have to be overnight, but it can be. Uh, in terms of giving, you have to have clear levels. If you have a, in church there's tippers and tithers. Tippers throw in a 20 every time they go. Tithers are doing first fruits giving of some kind. Um, it doesn't matter how much money it is, it, it matters where they're at in life and, and that they have had uh, what Martin Luther called the third conversion, conversion of the head, conversion of the heart, conversion of the purse or pocketbook depending on which time he said it. And if you have board members who are not tithers, they're spiritually unqualified to serve on the church board. They haven't had the third conversion. They aren't managing their f personal finances in a God-fearing way, and you're asking them to help manage the church finances. So you have to have some way of finding that out. And one good thing to do is when you call for nominations, call for names. By the way, we're going to be asking you about your, your giving. And so people do, so oh, my name stand okay. Are oh, you going to ask about my giving? You know what, this is sort of a bad time. Maybe in three years, get back to me. Uh, but those people who aren't financially invested still want some of the power and prestige of serving on the board, and they have all the wrong motives. So you have to talk about money. Annual review, uh, the, the pastor CEO deserves to know how they're doing. Under policy-based governance, you only ask about two questions. How are, what progress has been made on ends policies? This is every, all the results that we're seeing. Number two, any limitations policies violated and how are they corrected and how, how are we gonna make sure it's, this doesn't happen again? And that's the review. Your lay people, are going to want to say, well, you know, at the big company I work with, we've got 20 items, you've got to rate yourself on a scale of 1 to 5. What if we Christianize this and then have the pastor rate himself, okay? We're not supervising him if you're policy-based. You're overseeing. And I have a two-page handout that will explain that, which I can give you for free if you want. Send me an email. The board should review their bylaws at least once a year to make sure they're up to date, but more importantly, make sure they're following their own bylaws. So many times I come into congregations that are mid-size. We talk about shifting to a single board and policy-based governance. And I said, what do your bylaws say right now? They said, well, we don't really follow those. That's against the law. So you need to follow your bylaws or fix them. Board self-assessment is uh, uh, you can get these online for free, uh, you know, 50, 75 questions that you can rate yourselves. In the back of my book, it's got one uh, that you can use for free with, I think, uh, 78 questions or something like that. And then you see the areas where you're doing well and areas where you're doing not so well. In your policy manual, you want a list of every quarter, every month what business has to be taken care of. Like, when do you start the budget narrative? When do you see the draft budget? When do you bring the final budget to the voters? So you have all those things on there, and then you'll never be late on an important task. And every board should have an orientation program so that if I come on the board for a, a big, let's say a university, okay, I probably get no orientation, and then, uh, I have to watch for a year to see how things are done before I, can, before I feel free to open my mouth. It's much better to have an orientation program, uh, get minutes for the past two years, get a board policy manual, get any other ministry information, have them read the book Simple Church so that when they get on, they can start making a contribution right away. So you're feeling frustrated, but it can be fixed. And we have, Kathy's got some books in back if you're interested in purchasing one. On Amazon, it's $19.99. At the book table, it's $15. For the next 10 minutes, it's going to be $10 in the back, one per person. And if you decide you want to buy more, 
you can buy them through us at 20% discount free shipping or buy it through Amazon full price.